Hey, good afternoon and welcome back. I'm glad you all came back, even though there was a problem in finding a seat for everyone last time. Uh, I uh, would like you to turn in the uh, problem set if you've been able to do it. If you haven't been able to do it, that's no great problem. But I hope you find it mildly amusing. Uh, I have given that problem set out a couple of times over the years, and I can recall uh, one very pale student who appeared at my door the next morning saying, it's the first problem set, you've only talked an hour and I can't do it. Then it was another group of three who formed a consortium to attempt to solve the code using a computer. And they didn't get very far either. This is an interesting sort of problem because it requires you to think in a slightly different direction and you're accustomed to thinking and therefore it's a little bit amusing. Uh, this is not my creation. It came from a book by a man named Polya. The title of the book is Mathematics and Plausible Reasoning. And he gives this as an example of a problem that can be solved only if you think in a slightly different direction. I'll give you another example of a problem from his book. Uh, suppose, not that the problem arises in this area when you do all of your graphics on a computer console, but suppose you had to, in solving a problem on short notice, draw a circle that had a diameter of four inches. And you went looking for your pair of compasses, which you never use very often. And when you found them, they were rusted solid. And they were open to a distance of five inches. Okay, so there's the problem. You have a pair of compasses that can only draw a circle that's five inches in diameter. You must draw a circle that's four inches in diameter. What sort of construction, what sort of mapping out of arcs that you connected together could you do to create the circle of smaller diameter? Anybody have an idea? Seems impossible, doesn't it? Well, suppose you got yourself a little block of wood that had a height that was equal to the square root of 5 squared minus 4 squared. And so you have one end of the compasses up on top of the block of wood. The other end of the compasses tra tra traces out a circle that has a smaller diameter. It's fairly obvious. But what you have to do is to think of a problem that has poked your nose into two dimensions and think of it in terms of a three-dimensional problem and then the answer is easy. So that was the sort of thought-provoking thing that Paulia presented in one portion of his book. Okay, if you enjoyed that problem, uh, I have another one for you in a similar vein and uh, perhaps you'll enjoy this one as well. So while I'm talking, let me pass this around. I think there's enough for everyone. All right, last time I got so caught up with the displaying the heft of the international tables for X-ray crystallography that I forgot to mention entirely that there is another text that we will use in the, in the uh, class. And this we will not need until halfway through the semester. And therefore I did not feel terribly remiss in not mentioning it. It's a book by somebody named Nye and it's called The Physical Properties of uh, Crystals. And this is published by Oxford University Press and the publication date of the original edition was in 1967. This is a book that is uh, really, uh, I, I don't think I'm being extravagant, extravagant in calling it a classic. It is a beautifully written book. The first two thirds of it deals systematically with tensor properties, the uh, 
particular sort of uh, mathematics that's used to set them up, transformation of axes, and then looks at specific physical properties and numbers that uh, have to be described in terms of tensors. This is actually the third book in a sequence. There was a book by Worcester that uh, covered things very similarly, but the notation that was used for the uh, tensors was not the modern uh, current notation. And then the subject started in the form of a third book, uh, Waldemar Voigt. And the title of this book is Lehrbuch der Kristallphysik. And this was published back in 1910. And this is the first time anybody had anything to say on the matter. Uh, it, in fact, is a big, fat book that contains some topics that are not covered in Worcester and Nye. Um, Nye's book is beautifully written. The first two-thirds of it concerns tensor formalism. And the last third, which we will not touch at all, deals with thermodynamic relations between different properties that are uh, represented by tensors. So uh, I don't recommend you go out and buy this book until you determine whether or not you need it, because I'll try to make the lecture self-contained, and I'll have lots of notes and handouts. Uh, the problem with Nye's book and any book that is intensely mathematical is that you can't jump in on page 73 to find the answer to a specific question. Because when you go there, it will say, as we showed back in chapter 4, and what is he talking about? So you go back to chapter 4. And chapter 4 says, starting with our definition of chapter 2, and you have to go back and read chapter 2. So it's awfully hard to pick something out to answer a specific question. You have to really go all the way through it. Uh, the good news is that uh, Nye's book has been published in paperback. And it is available at the Coop. And paperback means cheap, cheap, or relatively inexpensive. No books are in, uh, really cheap these days. So we will uh, cover the material that's in there. We'll have a slightly different emphasis, but the notation in the general mathematics that's involved is in Nye's book. The second thing that I mentioned last time is that uh, there is a very, very nice and thorough and geometric treatment of crystal symmetry. And I said, that's the good news. The bad news is that it's out of print. So I promised, what a guy, that I give you a Xerox copy of the first half of the book. So here is the text that we'll use in the first part of the term. I included at the uh, beginning the table of contents so you can see the other, uh, the other topics that are covered in the book. Uh, we will not go through all of the material that's covered. Uh, there are a lot of different symmetries to be derived. And uh, it turns out that if you get the general idea and you can summarize the results, there is no need to derive every single one of them. Um, it's nice to know that there's a place where you can find out how it is done if you really have a particular question. Did everybody get a copy? Are there a few who did not? I made extras. OK, nobody in need of one. Great. OK, let me now start with a uh, general rhetorical question. Crystallography, as we mentioned last time, is the geometry of crystals. It's the geometry of patterns and the sorts of symmetries that are in those patterns. 
Now, you might ask yourself, why should I, as a material scientist or a physical scientist of some sort, worry about this stuff? I'm, I'm not training to be a wallpaper designer. I am going to do physical things. I'm going to heat things and uh, measure properties and that sort of thing. Well, there are at least three answers to that question. First of all, whether you like it or not, the arcane language of symmetry is the language that's used to describe crystals. It's the language that's used to describe structures. The normal thing that you do when you're trying to describe verbally a ball and pin model of the geometrical arrangement of atoms in a crystal is to say the red balls are at the corners of the cube, the green balls are in the middle of the edges, and the chartreuse balls are sort of tucked up inside one of the corners but slightly closer to one face than to the other two faces. The point I'm trying to make is that is a language that has limited utility. It deals, it's capable of dealing only with the simplest sort of atomic configurations. So there is a general language based on symmetry theory, based on group theory, that is universally used to describe atomic arrangements. So instead of saying red balls at the corners of the cube and green balls in the middle of the faces, I can say space group 4 over m, 3 bar 2 over m, atom A in position 4b, M3M, atom B in position for C, M3M. That's what rock salt is. And that is the way not only it, but especially more complicated structural arrangements are described in the literature. So this is the language of describing such arrangements. And finally, sooner or later, I bet you that every one of you will be involved with some crystalline material, and the first question you will answer is, what is its structure? What is the atomic arrangement? That's where properties start. And you'll go to a book or a set of volumes that describes structural data. There's a big, long compendium of books that fill about that much of a bookshelf, which are called structure reports. They started a number of years ago to compile all of the structures that had been determined within a given calendar year. They did a pretty good job of staying caught up back in 1915 and 1920. And then as it became easier to obtain such results, partly due to the advent of rapid uh, large computers, uh, they fell further and further behind, and I think now they're about five or ten miles, five or ten years, miles as well. Uh, but this is one of the places to go to look up without going to the original literature whether the material that you're interested in has had its atomic arrangement determined. When you go there, you're going to find the atomic arrangement not in terms of red balls at one position on the cell, but you're going to find it in terms of the language of symmetry theory. So one of the things I hope you'll be able to do by the time we finish this time together is to be able to go to such literature and know exactly what to do and where to go to reconstruct the geometrical arrangement of the atoms. OK, so hopefully you're at least mildly convinced that this exercise is going to be worthwhile. Before we continue where we left off last time, I would like to say a little bit about the language in which uh, these geometries are described. And uh, we mentioned last time, without thoroughly demonstrating why, that in a three-dimensional space, there are four basically different kinds of operations. And one of these is something that all crystals must, by definition, display. And this is the operation of translation. Analytically, it can be described as a mapping in which every coordinate in a space x, y, z is mapped to a location x plus some constant, y plus some constant, z plus some constant. And if you do the operation again, this would go to a location x plus 2a, y plus 2b, z plus 2c. 
a feature of translation that is unique to this particular symmetry transformation is that it has no origin. If I have a pair of motifs that are related by translation, we can think of them as being related by a vector, magnitude and direction, that takes this motif and moves it to this location. We said that more generally, we should view these operations not just acting on one little domain in space, but acting on everything. So this implies that there be a infinite chain of motifs if the operation of translation is to be present because only that infinite, doubly infinite string is consistent with all of space being mapped into itself. Like any vector, there's no unique origin. You could say it extends from here to here, or from here to here, or any other choice of translation, provided the direction and the magnitude are the same in every choice. As a result, it's not really possible to specify the locus of this particular operation. It has magnitude and direction, but no unique origin. What we can do through a very neat device is to nevertheless take some reference point and have each of these reference points separated by T and have each motor motif lurking off in space in exactly the same location and distance from this point that we've constructed. And this array of abstractions, these geometrical abstractions, these points, are what are called lattice points. And uh, they are a very neat summary of the translational periodicity of the crystal is absolutely essential not to mix up these lattice points, which are a construct that we have created in the atoms themselves that are present in a crystal. The atoms are atoms, and they're not necessarily the lattice points. Another way of saying that not all atoms of the same chemical species need be translation equivalent. We'll see some examples of this later on. So do not mix up the atoms and the lattice points. When I talk about the sodium chloride lattice, I mean an array of points in space that are located at the corners of a cube and in the middle of the faces of the cube. If I talk about the arrangement of sodium ions and chlorine ions, that is the sodium chloride structure and not the sodium chloride lattice. And then last time I apologized for usage so as not to appear hypocritical. Everybody talks about lattice vibration, lattice energy, lattice dynamics, and so on, but that's a misuse of the term. But nevertheless, it is much more musical than saying structure energy, structure vibration. So we'll go on misusing the term lattice, I'm afraid. OK, let's look at another operation. Here we change the sense of no coordinate. Let's next look at an operation that take, might take x, y, z and map it into minus x, y, z. This would be a situation where if I set up a coordinate system, um, here's x, here's y, here's z. What I've done is to take an object that sits off here at a coordinate plus x, and I've changed the sign of x so that this object now sits off here. This is exactly what happens when I take something and reflect it in a mirror. Okay? And if that's not immediately obvious, it just so happens, not at all by accident, I brought along with me a mirror. Okay, here is one hand, and if you look in the mirror, there is the other hand. It's the same distance behind the plane of the mirror. Uh, two coordinates have been left unchanged. The two coordinates within the plane of the mirror, if that is my choice of the reference system, and one of them has been reversed. 
Now I'll take the second motif out of the geometric construct and I'd like to point out one very curious feature of the pair of motifs that's generated by this transformation. They're both the same thing, okay, clearly. But no matter how I try, I cannot move one so that it coincides with the other. And we intuitively appreciate this difference by saying we actually use our hands by analogy. We say one is left-handed and one is right-handed. And they are not congruent. The fancy name that's used to describe this relation is to say that they are an antiomorphs. Another term that's used particularly in chemistry is to say that they are chiral. Which one is the left-handed one? Which is the right-handed one? Well, this is what I call my left hand. This is what I call my right hand. But can we distinguish them physically any other way? No, these are terms that have come into regular use in both our everyday language and also in science because we use our hands instinctively as readily available uh, examples of enantiomorphs, readily at hand, I might say, to almost make a pun. One of the really brilliant figures in physics was a man named Richard Feynman, uh, recently deceased. Um, Feynman gave a very famous series of lectures on science at Cornell University. And he has one entire lecture that was devoted to the difference between right and left. And he comes up with a funny story. He uh, pretends that the hero of the story is someone who is trying to communicate with beings in outer space and suddenly he gets lucky and he gets a response to his message. And they work out a way to communicate and eventually they try to describe each other to the other individual. Well, what do you look like? Well, we're bipedal and we have two organs related by reflection that let us sense light and form images and we have an aperture through which we ingest things that can be metabolized and our circulation and body works because we have a pump on the left hand side that circulates fluids through our... Wait, I don't understand, what's left? And so then there follows a long discourse on how to define left in an absolute sense. How, what is, how do you describe to someone what makes your left hand left and your right hand right without being anthropomorphic about it? So it goes on and on and on and he gets into physical phenomena which are objective and independent of a human being. And finally he comes to the anisotropic emission of beta particles in radioactive decay. And that depends on direction relative to the magnetic moment and that defines an absolute sense of right and left. So that's something physical that doesn't depend on the nature of the human being. And then Feynman wraps up his story by saying, if finally our extraterrestrial being travels to space, gets out of a spaceship and he walks forward to greet you and you put out your right hand and he puts out his left hand, get out of there fast. <laughs> because it means he is made out of antimatter. <laughs> and nuclei of matter in this anisotropic emission of beta rays shoot out the beta particle in one sense, antimatter shoots out the beta particle in the uh, chiral sense. So it's a cute little story that emphasizes the problem in defining absolutely left from right. But the of opposite handedness that we can say. Um, mirrors are interesting things and uh, I uh, brought along a couple of mirrors and uh, they have very, very peculiar uh, characteristics and I would invite you to come up and look at these uh, in private because I, if I hold them up in front of you, you're not going to be able to see what I'm doing at all, although I kid myself that you can, uh, and I'll walk around and show you what I'm doing. 
Here is uh, something scientific. It's a chemical compound, carbon dioxide. And uh, OK, and if I hand this down, you can see carbon dioxide in the mirror. You see that? Oh, it's not reflected. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't turn it on. Ah, now I think we can get it. And is it working now? Okay, now it's it's working. You can see why this is a very special kind of mirror, because it reflects only red letters, and it leaves the black letters unchanged. You see that? You're going to have to come up. I see some of you straining your necks. You'll have to come up and look at that in, in person. But the black letters are completely unchanged. The red letters are reflected into letters of an opposite chirality. It's a very special kind of mirror. It's got another uh, kind of mirror that works in a different way. Um, where is my other piece of paper? OK. OK, this is an interesting mirror because it reflects only male names and not female names. Uh, this was a very topical sort of mirror a few years ago when there was a lawsuit. There was a college down south called the Citadel, which would only admit male applicants and not female applicants. So I claimed that this was a mirror that I had got from the Citadel because it uh, uh, doesn't change uh, male names but does uh, uh, change, does reject or reflect female names. So you can play with this during our break. Um, but if I look at myself in the mirror, you know, I take a look at myself. Uh, if I wink my left eye, the guy in there winks his right eye back at me. So I'm not really seeing myself. What I'm seeing is my enantiomorph. Doesn't that shake you up? You have never, ever seen yourself in exactly the same way as other people see you. You are only familiar with your enantiomorph. Uh, does that make a difference? Well, I'll bring in something that I put together and I couldn't put my hands on. Uh, we are very, very sensitive to the symmetry in our faces. And if they are reflected left to right, you surely are going to look different to the other person. And the way to see that is to take a photograph of somebody and cut it down the middle and put the two different sides reflected left to right. And the expression on the person's face and the general spirit that that image conveys is entirely different if you use the one half of the face reflected left to right and the other half reflected left to right. So think of this. You, when you look in the mirror, you see you're an antiomorph, and other people see you differently. Okay, let me ask you to scratch your head now. Is there any time when, in point of fact, you may have seen yourself without being reflected into the enantiomorph? Yeah. Absolutely. A photograph or a TV monitor. When you look at uh, a picture on television, you can read all the signs. And they didn't make up special signs in reflection so that they'd look right when they photographed you. So photography or a video camera does not change the chirality. But I've got another way in which I can see myself in the exact same chirality. And this I can't really convince you of. You'll have to try it. If I put two mirrors together at 90 degrees and then adjust them so that I am looking right at the point of intersection 
so that my two images coincide, then I see myself in the normal way. If I now blink my left eye, this guy blinks his left eye at me too. This is really astounding. Two mirrors at 90 degrees, if you look at yourself right at their point of intersection, give you a non-chiral image of yourself. So I invite you to come up and try that. That's truly astounding. So why should somebody in material science or chemistry care about chirality? Does it really make any difference? Let me give you a little experiment that you can try. Um, suppose you have a little cell and a couple of pieces of Polaroid, and the cell has a glass front and a glass back, and you fill it with sugar solution. And then you pass a beam of polarized light through the sugar solution. And what happens is that the sugar solution rotates the direction of polarization in proportion to the thickness of solution that the light has passed through in proportion to the concentration of sugar. The plane of polarization gets rotated. And that's pretty curious. So you scratch your head about that. Why does that happen? Well, maybe I better go back and try it again. And a day or two later, you go back and you repeat the experiment. And once again, the plane of polarization rotates, but it rotates in the opposite direction. Okay? Um, the reason for this is that if I was not careful in cleanliness, and there were some little bugs lurking in the corners of that cell, and when they sensed the sugar solution, they said, wow, free lunch, and they crawled out and gobbled it up. Turns out those guys can gobble up just the sugar of one chirality. Sugar is a chiral molecule. And uh, in fact, there is a product uh, that's called invert sugar. And this is sugar that is all of one handedness. But everything in the world around us, everything from sugar beets to sugar cane to other things that make sucrose, manufacture sugar of one chirality not mixed. All chiral molecules that are produced by living organisms are all of the same chirality. If we make them synthetically, there's no reason to favor, favor synthesis of one molecule or the opposite handedness. So synthesized molecules are of equal proportion in the left-handed chirality and the right-handed chirality. This means that in the case of pharmaceuticals, at very best, you are going to use only half of the product that you've made. There is uh, a pharmaceutical product that is prescribed for attention deficit uh, disorder. This is called Ritalin. And only one chirality of the Ritalin molecule does anything for you. The other part is just metabolized and doesn't do anything. But there are other much more sinister cases. Uh, there was a serious problem about 20 years ago, primarily in Europe, where uh, a particular uh, pharmaceutical thalidomide was prescribed for pregnant women. It was to act as a sedative. Only one chirality of the molecule did this. The other chirality tragically uh, caused birth defects. So you have to be very careful about the chirality of the pharmaceutical molecule that you synthesize. Uh, another example, um, there is, I uh, don't remember the name of it. Uh, this is something that is uh, taken to, uh, this is something called, Ethambutol, which is used to treat tuberculosis. Only the molecule of one handedness does this, the other one causes blindness. That's really a sinister and antiomorph. Then there's some even crazier <laughs> examples. Ibuprofen is a chiral molecule. And this, in a most remarkable situation, is a molecule which your body converts to the molecule of the chirality that has the intended purpose. 
So here your body is clever enough to change ibuprofen into the molecule, which is the one that you need for its pharmaceutical effect. Okay, so mirrors are interesting things. Um, I would uh, invite you to come up and play with these special mirrors that do strange things and see yourself as others see you. And now I would like to continue on in this discussion to mention the, uh, the ways in which we can represent a mirror plane uh, in a graphic language. This is what a mirror plane does. It changes the sense of one coordinate. If there is a locus across which that transformation is performed, we would like, first of all, an analytic symbol some way of indicating the presence of that particular operation in a pattern. And a mirror is very descriptive, so the symbol M is used to represent the presence of a mirror plane in a particular uh, symbol. We might want to indicate a specific operation. Uh, there are only two operations in the case of a mirror plane reflecting left to right and reflecting right to left. But there are other operations such as rotation. If we have a 16-fold rotation axis, there's one operation that consists of rotating 1 16th of 2 pi, another operation that will also leave the space invariant that's rotating 2 16 of 2 pi, and so on. So an individual operation is something that we will want to designate. And for a mirror plane, uh, something that is used commonly in physics is to use the operation sigma for a particular reflection. Uh, this is not uh, done in Berger, if you get into reading it. He uses M for both. And then finally, it's uh, going to be convenient when we have a pattern before us uh, to use a geometric symbol to indicate in the pattern the locus of this particular operation. And uh, what we use in the case of a mirror plane is a bold line. And uh, if this were the pattern and we wanted to indicate where the mirror plane was or the mirror line in two dimensions that relates those two motifs, we draw it in thusly. We began last time to examine the properties of rotation, but that's another sort of uh, symmetry, and that is a rotation which takes place about a rotation axis. Uh, the symbol that uh, is used to represent the collection of operations, the analytic symbol, is based on the fact that the angular rotation, alpha, has to be equal to some submultiple of 2 pi. 2 pi over n, where n is some integer. And the reason for that, I think, is quite clear. If I take a particular motif and rotate through an angle alpha, um, if I am not rotating by some submultiple of 2 pi, I'll just go round and round and round, and I will never get a finite set of objects that is uh, separated from its neighbor by the same angular interval alpha. This will only happen if alpha is a, an integral submultiple of 2 pi. And the symbol that is used for uh, the collection of operations that is usually embodied in a rotation axis is n, the same n that is in the denominator. The symbol for an individual rotation, as we mentioned last time, we have to specify the location of the point about which we rotate, and we have to indicate the angle alpha through which we've rotated. So a alpha will be a, an individual operation, and the geometric symbol will be an n-gon, which has the symmetry of the rotation axis. So for a six-fold axis, we would use a hexagon. For a five-fold axis, we will use a, a pentagon. For a four-fold, a square. 
for a threefold, a triangle. Now, an n-gon with 180-degree rotation is a line segment. And that would be easily overlooked, and it's not very aesthetic. So here we indulge in a little bit of artistic license and fatten out the middle of the line segment to get an oval with pointed ends. And that's the symbol for a two-fold axis. What about a one-fold axis? Well, one-fold axes exist anywhere, so you can sprinkle them around with reckless abandon. A one-fold axis has no symmetry at all, but that is a very nice uh, symbol to use for no symmetry at all. So symmetry one is the absence of symmetry. So it does come up occasionally in notation. Now, if you look at what we've done so far, we have a transformation that changes the sense of no coordinate. We have a transformation that changes the sense of two coordinates, one coordinate, no coordinate, one coordinate. Rotation is interchanging the sense of two coordinates in a plane. And in a two-dimensional pattern, that's all there is. But for a three-dimensional space, we have the option of changing the sense of no coordinate, the sense of one, the sense of two, or the, change the sense of all three coordinates. So if this is x, and this is y, and this is z, and up here in space lurks my initial motif, if I change the sense of x, the sense of y, and the sense of z, namely take x, y, z, and map it to minus x, minus y, minus z, what I'm going to do is to essentially turn the object inside out. And if my initial one was right-handed, I will produce a chiral object, a left-handed object. Uh, this is an operation which is called inversion. And this operation of turning the object inside out, if you will, is inverting it to a new location. And this analytically is the change in coordinates provided the point of inversion is at the center. Uh, the analytic symbol for inversion is one with a bar over the top, pronounced one bar. And uh, I'll have to leave to later uh, indication of exactly where that uh, notation comes from. The individual operation is also called one bar. And the geometric symbol that is used to indicate the location of an inversion center is uh, a tiny little open circle, large enough so that you don't miss it, but not so large that it might be confused with an atom in a drawing of an atomic arrangement. So in this case, we would adorn our sketch with a little circle at the origin if that was the point through which the space was being inverted. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is our basic bag of tricks in three dimensions. Let me point out that uh, inversion can exist in three dimensions only. Because I have to have three coordinates to play with, or else I cannot define the operation. Suppose I have uh, an op mapping operation x, y, z that goes to minus x, minus y, minus z, and I get rid of z to make it two-dimensional. Then my transformation is x, y going to x minus x, minus y, and that's exactly what a two-fold axis does. Okay. So inversion, when you throw out the third coordinate, looks like 180 degree rotation. So you need three dimensions in order to define that transformation. If we really wanted to go crazy, we could go on to say what happens in four dimensions. There should, in principle, be five different operations. 
And yes, mathematically, you can define them. They're very difficult to draw because we have to have some sort of operation that takes something and pulls it out of our three-dimensional world. We have no idea where it went, and then all of a sudden, it pops back into our space. But mathematically, there are cases when you need a fourth variable to describe the symmetry of an arrangement. And this generally occurs in something called a modulated structure, where there is a periodic change in some variable other than the atomic positions. And let me give you uh, two quick examples without going into it exhaustively. Um, one characteristic of an atom, besides its location and its atomic mass and things like that, is uh, perhaps a magnetic atom that has a magnetic moment attached to it. Okay? There are magnetically ordered structures. One of them looks exactly like rock salt and I'll draw just the magnetic cations, which sit in locations like this. And uh, the magnetic moment here is up, the magnetic moment here is up, the magnetic moment here is down, the magnetic moment here is down. So what I've drawn here is no longer the lattice. And in fact, the lattice constant of this material is, looks like rock salt as far as the atomic positions are concerned, but the magnetic moments uh, have to be continued on in another uh, direction. Uh, it's some extra distance. Uh, actually, some examples of this sort of behavior is FeO, cobalt oxide, nickel oxide. All of these cations are magnetic. They have magnetic moments which are ordered, and the unit cell turns out to be, when you take magnetic moment into account, um, a larger cell, a supercell. There's a more interesting type of magnetic structure, though, in which the magnetic moment is inclined relative to some translation in the structure. And the magnetic moments all lie on the generators of cones. But as you walk along the chain of atoms, the orientation of the moment rotates to different orientations. Um, there is a family of materials that are said to have helical spin structures. in which the periodicity of the march of the magnetic moment around the surface of the cone occurs with a period that is incommensurate with the spacing of the chain of atoms. So strictly speaking, this material does not have a lattice in this direction. So it's not a crystal, unless you use a fourth variable to uh, describe the periodicity of the orientation of the moment. And one final one at the risk of carrying this too far. Here's a pattern that is based on a square lattice. It has a fourfold axis in it. Unless I make the pattern out of squares that are black and white, make a checkerboard. Okay, this is now no longer a fourfold axis because I can't rotate 90 degrees and leave the pattern invariant. So this is an example of something called a black-white symmetry or a color symmetry. And it requires more than just uh, four operations to describe the relation between one mo motif and another. We need a fourth operation, switching of the color from black to white or switching it from white to black. That's a fourth operation, again, within the confines of a pattern that exists in our space. Yes? So you're saying it doesn't have that even rotational symmetry? No, I didn't say no rotational symmetry. Uh, if it has a fourfold axis here, but this used to be a fourfold axis, and that now changes into a twofold axis. And then I have the problem of describing how this square is a square exactly like this square except for its color. 
So I need then an operation which rotates 90 degrees and then switches from white to black. And then rotates 90 degrees again and switches from black to white. So there's a this operation, a color change, that is necessary in a three-dimensional space, or a fourth operation, a color change in a two-dimensional checkerboard, for example. Okay? So there are lots of nuances to uh, symmetry theory. It's mathematics, and the nice thing about mathematics is it's your ball game. You can make up the rules, and as long as you play according to those rules consistently, then you've got something that people can't quarrel with. Okay, I think my internal clock has just told me that it's five minutes of the hour and it's time to take our break. Um, come up by all means and play with the mirrors if you like and we'll resume the uh, lecture part of our discussion in 10 minutes. <laughs>